Hello, my name is Sam Felton, the Director of the Public Health Collaboration, and welcome to our 2021 virtual conference. It's been a difficult year to say the least, but I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to all of our ambassadors, members, patrons, and scientific advisory board members for all of your support through these difficult times. Without you, we would never be able to continue to better inform the public about the power of lifestyle to help create a better world. Now, before I let the next presenter speak, this conference is 100% free for all forever. However, if you find the content here today valuable, uh, then please consider a £2 donation or whatever you can afford via www.phcuk.org forward slash donate or if you're in the UK, you can simply text PHC to 70660 to donate £2 directly from your phone. And of course, texts are charged at your standard network rate. We hope you enjoy the conference from wherever you are in the world and be sure to get involved in the civil conversation here on YouTube or by using the hashtag PHC vcon 2021 on facebook instagram and twitter thanks for your support and be well hello absolute pleasure to be with you for this virtual public health collaboration i'm campbell murdoch i'm a gp i've got a special interest in metabolic health and i've had a long interest in type 2 diabetes and reversal and remission of type 2 diabetes with the low carbohydrate diet. Now, over the years, I found one of the barriers for patients improving their type 2 diabetes with a low carbohydrate diet was that their healthcare professionals were struggling to know what to do with medication. So some years ago with uh, David Unwin and some colleagues, we wrote a paper on what to do with medication when somebody reduces their carbohydrate intake if they are taking diabetes medication. I'm going to share the highlights from this the, the paper now in this talk titled Adapting Diabetes Medication for the Low Carbohydrate Management of Type 2 Diabetes. First of all, I will share a case study with you just to put everything in context. So I want you to imagine a 64 year old male. He's had type two diabetes for 15 years. He has high blood pressure. He has NAFLD, which basically means fatty liver. He's got chronic kidney disease stage three, which basically means his kidneys aren't filtering quite as well as they once were. He's struggling with um, not being able to lose weight. He's got IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, and he's also um, quite depressed. His recent uh, diabetes review blood test showed a reasonably high HbA1c, so a measure of his blood glucose of, over the last three months of 74. Also showed his liver test ALT was high at 72. His triglycerides were high at 3.2, and his HDL cholesterol was low at 0.8, high triglycerides and a low HDL cholesterol is, is, a, is not a sign of, of good metabolic health. His blood pressure there, 150 over 86. And as you can see, his, his BMI, 40.2, not a great measure, but with a, a measure, BMI is not a great measure, but weight there of 130 kilos. I think you can see that um, he will be struggling with uh, excess body fat. His current medication is on glycoside, full dose of that, uh, blood glucose lowering drug. He's on metformin, full dose of that. He's on liver glutide to lower his blood sugar. He's on loperamide to try and deal with the diarrhea he gets with his irritable bowel syndrome. He's on a full dose of ramipril, which is used to lower blood pressure and um, also may be useful for the kidneys. He's on a reasonably high dose of statin. He's on citalopram for his depression. And he's on allegliptin, another diabetes drug, empiloglifosin, another diabetes drug, and two types of insulin. Now, just for effect, those last four drugs have been added to this case study. So the, uh, the person wasn't actually taking those four drugs, but I've added them on for the purpose of this presentation. 
This person was strictly following a low fat diet, very, very strictly, um, was, was dry frying anything he had, uh, vegetables in a pan with no oil, very good quality pan. And he was also doing a fair bit of cardio exercise at the gym. So one of the questions I often pose with this is, do we think this is a sign of a um, modern medical care at its best? Is this a good health outcome for this person? I think my um, thought on this would be probably not the best considering the amount of uh, medical care that he seems to be receiving. So the learning objectives for this session, and uh, this session is a presentation for healthcare professionals, but it's also a presentation for people with type two diabetes to share it with their healthcare professional. What I do want to make very clear is, everything I cover in this session is not personalized advice, do not change your type 2 diabetes medication without discussing it with your uh, trusted doctor or nurse. So the four uh, learning objectives are know the three key considerations for deciding what to do with diabetes medication when someone with type 2 diabetes reduces their carbohydrate intake. Know how to adjust drugs that risk hypoglycemia, so low blood sugar, and these are the sulfonylureas, meglitinides and insulins. Three, be alert to the drug that can cause ketoacidosis. This is the SGLT2 inhibitors, or often known as flozins. And four, consider the drugs that have no short-term risk, but where the risk to benefit ratio may alter once carbohydrate has been reduced. So just as I mentioned at the beginning, what I'll cover in this is based in a paper we wrote for the British Journal of General Practice, adapting diabetes medication for the low carbohydrate management of type 2 diabetes, a practical guide. This paper is open access, which means anybody can access it. And there is a useful table in there, which um, I will share at the end. So first of all, what are the three key clinical considerations for somebody if they have type 2 diabetes, they're on medication and they're going to change their diet to a low carbohydrate diet? So first of all, is there a risk of any of their drugs causing hypoglycemia? low blood sugar or other adverse event. Two, what is the degree of carbohydrate restriction they're going to embark on with their diet? Three, once carbohydrate is reduced, does, the, does any drug that they're on continue to provide health benefit? And if it does continue to provide health benefit, does that benefit still outweigh any risks of the drug? Because as the requirement for the drug may now be reducing, the risk benefit ratio will also be altering and therefore most of the drugs will need to be reviewed. First of all, the first group of drugs, uh, the ones that can risk hypoglycemia, as I've mentioned already, these are the sulfonylureas and the meglitinides. Very few people, I believe, take meglitinides now. Sulfonylureas um, tell the pancreas to release insulin and it will do that even if blood sugar isn't high. So even if blood glucose isn't high, these drugs will um, push the pancreas to release more insulin. And obviously, if the pancreas is being pushed to release more insulin and blood glucose isn't high, there is a risk of blood sugar going too low. The general advice for these is on the commencement of a low carbohydrate diet, then at least half the dose of these medications and then continue to titrate down. Um, what that means is basically as the blood glucose is regularly below 10, you can half the dose again. The blood glucose will probably then go up for at least a few days, maybe into the low teens. Then you can half the dose again as it gets down below sort of eight or 10. And then that way we may get a short period of high blood glucose, but that's probably far safer than risking blood glucose going too low without adjusting down the dose. Obviously, if blood glucose is remaining in the low or even mid-teens, then you may delay reducing the dose or you may put it back up until they've had some further reversal of their type 2 diabetes. I would say watch out for patients that um, sometimes these drugs are doing quite powerful things in a few patients and um, some patients with some rarer uh, types of diabetes often misdiagnosed as type 2 diabetes you can sometimes stop these and blood glucose can shoot up. These patients should all have test meters and strips for their glucose, so encourage them to test regularly. You'll need that information to decide what to do next with 
the dosing of these. The other group of drugs that can obviously cause low blood sugar are the insulins. Um, obviously, if you're injecting insulin, which is driving blood glucose down and you eat less glucose, there is a risk of glucose going too low. In reality, most patients with type 2 diabetes are extremely insulin resistant. And if they're extremely insulin resistant, that will mean much of the insulin they're already injecting is probably having limited impact. So you typically find for people with type 2 diabetes that you have quite a lot of leeway to play with with adjusting doses. Um, and you don't have to be overly um, cautious. Having said that, the standard approach, and again, everybody's experience is different, but the standard approach is put all the insulin that they're on into one uh, long acting type, all the units into one acting type, long acting type, and then reduce that total dose by a third to a half, and then continue to titrate down. So again, um, reduce the insulin, the blood glucose will hopefully go no higher than the high teens, sorry, the low teens. If it's regularly in the mid or high teens, then you may want to increase the insulin a bit again. As they continue on the low carbohydrate diet and the insulin resistance improves, the blood glucose will be down regularly below eight to 10, at which point you can then reduce the insulin again. For many patients, um, they can hope to come off the insulin or significantly reduce it. Uh, I would never promise to anyone they'll definitely stop their insulin because you don't know how they will get on. Also to be very cautious of is there will be some patients that you may have that are misdiagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And in fact, they have type 1. And uh, obviously, you don't want to stop their insulin. And um, you'll know about these people because as you reduce their insulin dose, even if they're on a low carbohydrate diet, their blood glucose won't come down further. So that should stop you reducing the insulin further. Um, equally to note, if somebody's had type 2 diabetes for a very long time, then maybe, uh, then maybe they've kind of converted into a burnt out pancreas. And again, these people aren't going to come off their, their insulin. So tailor it to the individual, but equally a fairly straightforward methodology there. The next key group of drugs to be aware of and be cautious about are the SGLT2 inhibitors, or otherwise known as the flozins. Flozins um, encourage the body to pee out excess glucose um, are often there's some obviously quite good data coming through about um, the benefits of these drugs They're obviously getting rid of that excess glucose which is going to be helpful to the body however in the context of a low carbohydrate diet we need to be more cautious so these drugs can cause a condition called ketoacidosis which is very high ketones in the blood it's a rare condition but these drugs have been known to cause it it is thought that a low carbohydrate diet plus these drugs might increase fat risk further. Now, a low carbohydrate diet alone cannot cause ketoacidosis. It can cause nutritional ketosis, but it cannot cause ketoacidosis. But these drugs, these flows in drugs can cause ketoacidosis. One of the other worries with these drugs is they can cause ketoacidosis even with a normal blood glucose level, and that can throw somebody off, a clinician off the scent if they're trying to work out why a patient is sick. Because in a low carbohydrate diet, we're reducing the amount of glucose that goes in through the mouth at the top end, the general consensus is, well, we don't need to take the drug anymore that's peeing the glucose out the bottom end. And because these drugs risk ketoacidosis, the safe thing to do is just to stop them when the person commences a low carbohydrate diet. So again, quite straightforward in the community setting, I think the safe thing to do when the person goes on the low carbohydrate diet is simply stop these drugs. So that was the drugs that carry a kind of a high risk and you need to be alert for. The rest of these medications do not carry any short term risk um, as far as being having type two diabetes and moving to a low carbohydrate diet but we will discuss them because the decision-making of their use over the longer term will change. So it's metformin, GLP-1 agonists, the glitazones, and the DBPP-4 inhibitors or gliptins. 
So firstly, metformin, which is basically the only bioguanide that we use. Uh, this has a huge range of mechanisms of working, one of which is reducing how much sugar the liver makes. There is um, perfect safety in continuing this medication. Clinically, what I always do is review um, with a patient when they move to a low carbohydrate diet, whether or not they've been having any side effects from this medication. I've come across more than a handful of patients who have been suffering from bowel upset, uh, taste disturbance um, for many years, and unfortunately it hadn't been picked up as a side effect of metformin. Um, about one in four people apparently get some sort of gastrointestinal side effect from metformin. And if that is showing itself, then I will discuss with the patient if they are keen to definitely stick the low carbohydrate diet, we should just stop the metformin. And often their, their, um, their bowel problem they've had for years and the taste disturbance they've had for years often disappear within just a few days. Next, we have the GLP-1 agonist. Um, probably have a couple of actions. One, slowing the speed at which the uh, stomach empties, and two, possibly having an effect on the um, satiety center in the brain, helping with both of these actions, obviously, helping to um, make people feel full, slowing the uh, offload of carbohydrate out of the stomach, and uh, with one of these actions being the uh, people may eat less. Now these will only have an impact on blood glucose if blood glucose is high as well. And um, so there is no short term risk with them. So people can continue them. Uh, equally, some people on a low carbohydrate diet who have seen some success but aren't quite managing to get their blood glucose to their ideal could even start these medications, um, which for some people is, is helpful. In reality, if somebody is doing well on a low carbohydrate diet, keen to stick with it, then vast, vast majority of people who are on these drugs should be able to come off them, I would say inside a year, often sooner. Next, we have the glitazones. Uh, glitazones are very rarely used now, um, but there may be a few patients still on them. Glitazones, one of their ways of working is they tell the body to grow fat. They sensitize the body's fat stores to insulin. And if you can grow fat, then you've got somewhere to store excess glucose and it will help with insulin resistance and therefore help with blood glucose homeostasis. So um, one of these pointers to recognize that actually getting fatter can lower your blood glucose if it's done in certain ways. Now, these medications do come with um, some possible serious long term side effects, although, um, of course, they'll be relatively rare but they do exist. So the suggestion is for these, the risk benefit ratio will alter when somebody adopts a, car a low carbohydrate diet. Therefore, in the majority of cases, over time, these drugs should be stopped. Again, don't need to rush off them on day one, but I expect over a period of anywhere between a month and 12 months, most people should be able to stop these medications if they continue with the low carbohydrate diet. And then we have the DPP4 inhibitors. Uh, these inhibit GLP-1 breakdown. Um, again, no short-term risk at all with these medications. Um, however, the um, benefit on a low carbohydrate diet in the clinical setting seems to be very negligible. Would say for the majority of patients I've seen who take these with and then move to a low carbohydrate diet, we find these drugs don't do anything um, for their blood glucose control. Um, as with all drugs, they do come with some side effects, a couple of potentially quite serious, um, even though rare. So general consensus is again, over time, these can be stopped. Again, don't need to rush off for them on day one, but some point over a month, two months, three months, 12 months, they can be stopped. So in summary, we have the insulin, sulfonylureas, meglitinides that can cause hypoglycemia. These need to be reduced and likely eventually stopped or significantly lower dose. Uh, the GLP, so SGLT2 inhibitors, the flozins, uh, suggestion is just stop these because of the risk of ketoacidosis. The GLP1s, glitazones, DPP4 inhibitors, 
likely to stop in the long term and metformin optional weigh up the pros and cons and assess for any side effects the patient may be experiencing. This is a table from the British Journal of General Practice um, article, which I uh, suggest um, to print out and stick on your wall. Uh, as you've heard, this is a fairly straightforward process for people. So hopefully um, adjusting medication shouldn't be a barrier to patient success with a low carbohydrate diet. Um, you'll also see on there, Acarbos is mentioned, which um, we I don't think ever use anymore, but you certainly don't need a low carbohydrate diet because if you're not eating large amounts of carbohydrate, you don't need a drug that's gonna block you from digesting it. And also mentioned at the bottom there, self-monitoring can be quite powerful for patients. If you eating food and seeing what effect it has on your blood glucose, then um, that can be really useful to help drive behavior change. So just back to our case study now, our 64 year old male. So a year later, type two diabetes is now in remission. He's still mildly hypertensive. The non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has cleared. Uh, the kidneys are, are no worse. His obesity has improved. His IBS is gone and he's no longer feeling depressed. His HbA1c, as it shows there, is 46, so um, potential to go a bit lower, but he's certainly under the diabetes diagnosis threshold, so we can call it in remission a year on. His ALT, so that liver test is normal now. Triglycerides are looking really good. HDL cholesterol, normal. His blood pressure, 135 over 70. That's okay. Um, as many of you may find, blood pressure in some people drops significantly. Other people, it, it improves uh, somewhat, but not always um, back to the level when they were 18. And you can see he's lost 40 kilos of weight there. Uh, there may be a few more pounds or kilos to lose, but he's pretty happy with that. Medication wise, he's now off the glycoside. He's half the metformin dose. He was keen to stick with that half dose. By halving the dose, it um, resolved his IBS uh, symptoms and he got on okay with the lower dose and he was keen to stick with it. The liraglutide has been stopped. Um, the loperamide has been stopped because his IBS was the cause for his diarrhea. And the, and the, well, he didn't have IBS, he had side effect of metformin. No longer has that side effect. Uh, he stayed on the ramipril at a higher dose because his blood pressure is just okay. And he's got the CKD free. Um, statin wise, he was keen to continue, um, but wished to reduce the dose. And then the other drugs, had he been actually taking them, we would have uh, stopped all of those. And he's now following a low carb diet and he's still enjoying his gym activity. So uh, just a reflection on that, think about this scenario compared to how he was at the beginning. And I would say this is the sign of much more effective healthcare that we should be um, expecting as normal for the vast majority of people we have with type two diabetes. So I hope that's interesting. It is very simple. Do look at the British Journal of General Practice article that we wrote, it is just two pages. Follow the general principles, tailor it to your patient, be cautious with the insulins, the sulfonylureas and the uh, flozins. Um, think about those before the person actually makes any dietary change so you can plan in when you might reduce those. Uh, the rest of the medication, you can take a more leisurely uh, look at uh, reviewing over the next month or so. Um, and um, of course, learn from your patients, learn what happens and um, help your patients on their journey. Enjoy the rest of the conference. It's been a real pleasure being with you and hopefully look forward to seeing you at some point in person at a, a, uh, a real live uh, PHC conference.